Um, welcome this evening. This is going to be a really interesting program. Um, I wanted to let you know about some of our upcoming programs. Um, our next forum will be in two weeks on February 9th, and it's titled Revisiting the Church in the City Initiative. And we're going to have the mayors of three inner ring cities, um, Mayor Susan Infeld from University Heights, Mayor Bradley Sellers from Warrensville, uh, Warrensville Heights, Mayor Georgine Wello from South Euclid. And the program will be moderated by Len Calabrese, who is the former director of the Commission of Catholic Community Action. Uh, that's February 9th, right here. Um, the Institute of Catholic Studies next program it, um, has the theme, Jesuits for the Next Generation. General Congregation 36 and the Future of a Society of Jesus. And um, that will be on Thursday, March the 30th. There are flyers in the back, um, right here. Um, and the speaker then will be the very Reverend Timothy P. Kosicki, um, and it should be a good program. Um, first, I want to introduce Phil Haas, who's the Director of Archives for the Diocese of Cleveland. Phil, where are you? Here in the back. Uh, Phil brought a lot of photos and a variety of uh, materials from the history of um, Catholic Charities and other social service uh, delivery agencies, um, and it's really interesting uh, stuff. Um, I want to introduce our panel now, um, starting with Father Walter Jenny, who grew up in Illyria and attended Illyria Catholic High School, Borromeo College, and St. Mary's Semin Seminary. He received a Master's of Social Work degree from the Catholic University of America. Father Jenny was ordained in the priesthood in 1970. In 1974, he was assigned to work part-time with Catholic Charities, with residents at Parmadale, and was named Associate Director of Catholic Charities in 1977, and then Director of Catholic Charities in 1980. He's had other assignments, including at St. Coleman, St. Catherine in Cleveland, and St. Basil, the Great Parish. Sister Judith Van Karam is a member of the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine, Augustine, excuse me, and has served as its congregational leader since July 2013. Previously, she served as President and CEO of the Sisters of Charity Health System from 1998 to 2013. She has extensive experience in healthcare administration, including service as CEO of several Sisters of Charity health system hospitals, developing new joint venture hospitals, forming healthcare partnerships, restructuring partnerships, developing conversion foundations, developing a nursing home, serving 22 Catholic religious congregations, and lecturing on behalf of the uninsured. Sister Judith Ann received her Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy from Duquesne University, Master of Science in Hospital and Health Service Administration from Ohio State University, and she's an avid Cleveland Indians and OSU Buckeyes fan. <laughs> Pat Perot has had a Catholic charity since 2011. His career includes extensive experience managing multiple subsidiaries and working with boards, hospitals, and long-term care organizations. Pat is a native Clevelander. He graduated from John Carroll undergraduate and from Central Michigan University in graduate program. He previously served as president and chief executive officer at St. Augustine Health Ministries, responsible for managing St. Augustine Towers Assisted Living, St. Augustine Manor, and the Child Enrichment Center, the Holy Family Hospice, Emerald Village Retirement Community, and several other special ministries. Pat, I'm going to turn this over to you. Well, good evening and thank you for joining us. Uh, we plan to give you a rich history of the Catholic Diocese and how the charities were formed within the diocese. So we'll be going over history in the, the one of the, we would not have charities in the diocese without the sisters. And that's many different orders of sisters, congregations that came to the diocese shortly after it was formed. Uh, and Two directors ago, Father Walt Jenny, um, he, he kind of ushered Catholic Charities into the modern era, we like to say. He kind of uh, made it more professional. We had a lot of diverse agencies that were part, you know, part of this federated umbrella, and he kind of brought them in and began to bring them in. But I'll be back in a little bit. I want to introduce Father Walt Jenny and have him do his introduction. 
Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you. Um, everybody else has a PowerPoint. I don't have a PowerPoint, OK? <laughs> I never used a computer until I got to St. Basil's. Uh, and I've been there 22 years since Catholic Charity. So, But actually, uh, we didn't um, have any you know, computers back in the day. I mean, you can see how fast this and rapidly this is. I had a secretary, um, uh, Carm Vignon, and Carm was using an IBM Selectric, okay? Yeah. And um, I tried to convince her that she should get on a computer, and she said, I can do anything that damn thing can do, and I can do it better. And I said, okay, so, but my great progress was back in the day when they started with the IBMs, they had like a screen up there on top where you could make corrections, so I got her that far at least, which was a one of my greatest accomplishments in Catholic Charities, I think. Um, you know, I remember when I was in social work school, um, one of the most um, important uh, teaching moments for me, uh, and it was all about the church's role in serving the poor. And I, I think if there's anything that we're about, Primarily, it is serving the least among us. I think that's what we've got to be all about, and that's what the history tells us. But just for your information, I was quite taken by the fact that one of our professors at Catholic U taught us that, or told us that, you know, the, the whole idea of helping people in need actually began with the church. And the image in the Middle Ages was just many, many people lined up outside monasteries to receive assistance. That's where they went to. There wasn't anywhere else to go. This is way before Elizabethan poor laws and the development of different kinds of systems to help the poor. So um, we have a long history going back to the beginning to be just where we should be, and that's being of need, responding to the needs of the poor. And I, that's something that I think we can all be very, very proud of. So let me just hit the early history of the diocese, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sister so you can hear about the impact of religious women coming into the diocese. So, and this is, now what you gotta remember about this is all this stuff that I'm gonna talk about now early on was all done on horseback, okay? There was no other way to travel. So this um, Father Edward Fenwick, Fenwick in 19, 1821 was appointed Bishop of Ohio, okay? Not only of Ohio, but all of Michigan and of parts of what I think would be kind of western and southern Wisconsin. And the only way he could travel in that territory again was by horseback, and that's how we got there. So and the whole it all kind of evolved from there. Uh, that was in, in June of 19, 1821. He became bishop of what then was known as the Ohio Territory. Um, this is a little known fact, but it's significant. The sea city in Ohio was Cincinnati. So people will ask, well, why is the archbishop in Cincinnati? Because that was the first diocese, and it became the archdiocese. So that's why Cincinnati is the archdiocese, and the bishop there is indeed the archbishop. In 1821, there were 6,000 Catholics out of about 580,000 people uh, who lived in Ohio. So 6,000 out of those 580,000 were Catholic. Um, in the early days, in the 1820s, the people basically were pretty much universally poor. And then with subsequent industrial growth and development, and fortunately for us, that all took place on the northern part of the diocese, because it was accessible. It was accessible from the lake. The lake was the key, I still believe, Lake Erie is the key to the future of the other Great Lakes, you know? Because those rivers came up, it enabled uh, industrialization to take place. If you go up and down from Toledo to Huron to Lorraine to Cuyahoga County, you know, that's where they come in, that's where they continue to come in. Not in the same numbers, but every summer you go up there and watch war carriers laboring back and forth, going all the way out east in Ohio. So that whole industrial revolution began and really took off in, in the Cleveland area. The, the first church in Cleveland was St. Mary's of the Flats that was constructed or opened in 1835, okay? That's the first church, first parish church in the Diocese of Cleveland. 
1840, Father Louis Amadeus Rapp came to Ohio from his native friends, and he also brought with him, and pretty soon I'll get to sister, he also brought with him uh, three sisters of Notre Dame de Moor, and they served with him in the Cleveland area, and then eventually they went with him up to uh, Toledo, and they staffed a school in Toledo. In 1846, there was a Provincial Council of Bishops in Baltimore. It was known as the Sixth Provincial Council, and they recommended the establishment of a new diocese to serve the northern territory of Ohio. Obviously, that's us. And they also suggested to the Holy Father that this Father Louis Amadeus Rapp become the first bishop of that north end of the state diocese. So Pope Paul IV accepted the recommendation for a new diocese. Uh, Cleveland became the sea city. Again, it's not an archdiocese, it's the sea city. Cincinnati is and will always remain, I believe, the archdiocese. But Bishop Rapp was then appointed the first bishop of the Diocese of Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland grew from 45,000 inhabitants in 1840 in 1848 to 130,000 in 1870, and as many of us can attest to, um, in 1848 there were about 4,000 Irish folks in Cleveland, and then by the end of the 1870s, everybody began to come. The Slavs, the Bohemians, the Poles, the Hungarians, the Slovaks, certainly the Irish, they all found their way to Cleveland. And then for the next 40 years, Cleveland would grow and expand basically industrial and industrially and continue to attract many, many immigrants from Europe. And it was probably mostly done by word of mouth. That's how my family got here, you know, from Ireland. They, my mom came first uh, to Pittsburgh, and then she met my father, ended up in, in Illyria, and then subsequent to that, my uncle and his wife and their children came. So it all just kind of grew exponentially. Um, most important, I think, in this whole conversation is that since the establishment of the Diocese of Cleveland in 1847, the diocese has always been about the business, and this is exactly where I think we need to be. I probably wouldn't be here if I didn't think we were in this, is to attend to the needs of children and families. And in those early days, there were really no facilities uh, to serve children to serve families to adults. It just wasn't anything because it had just been been established. So I'm going to, was, and it really was the newly arrived women religious that came to the diocese who began to establish all these remarkable facilities to serve people in need. So I'm with Judith and I'm going to turn it over to Sister Judy and let her continue from here and I'll be back. I never was, um, my community never had any deliberation about me being a teacher because I could never figure out all this stuff, so. <laughs> I think I should shut it off. <laughs> Just wanted to start out with a little bit of talking about who are we as women religious, who are we? And I think that um, I'd like to talk about who are we as an apostolic women religious? Who are we as apostolic women religious? And what you see here is uh, a description of what the components are of women religious. I'm gonna tell you a lot of stories today, and the best way for me to depict the impact of women religious, especially as it relates to serving the poor in this community before Catholic Charities was formed, is by telling you a lot of stories. So what is religious life? It's a state of life. It's not us joining a membership of a club or anything like that. It really is a state of life. And uh, our, our life has been described by Sister Joan Chittister as, we are God seekers. All our life, we are seeking God. We have solemn profession of vows. We have personal and communal prayer. Our life is lived in common with God as the center of our lives. And we, this is most important in what I'm trying to, what I'll be talking to you about this, this evening. And that is, 
We are apostolic. We are here to give service to people. And that is what our mission is. We are missioned by our religious congregation to serve people. That's what apostolic women religious are about. And what is compelling is we serve people because people are in need. There are unmet needs of people that we serve. And these change over time. They have changed 160 plus years of my congregation has been um, uh, in existence because the needs of the people change. And we need to understand that we're here to serve God's people. And we witness the gospel values, mission, and service. So what brought religious to Northeast Ohio? What brought them here? And I would, I would say that um, some of us were invited by the bishop. Some of us were invited by the bishop. The bishop was probably involved in some way. The second is that, as Father Walt was saying, there are a lot of ethnic groups coming to this country. And many of them settled in Northeast Ohio. And many of the congregations came from Europe and followed the ethnic group, whether it was German, whether it was Croatian, whether it was French. Uh, a lot of communities that came here were from French origins. So, and then the third is that there was a ministry to be provided. There was a ministry to be provided. So I want to talk about the first two, which was 1850. The Ursuline Sisters of Cleveland came from Boulogne-sur-Mer, France. It's a, it's a um, harbor town, and I've, I've been able to be there twice. And uh, Sister Miriam was there once with me, uh, and that's 1850. Uh, Bishop Amadeus Rapp came from Boulogne-sur-Mer. He was chaplain to the Ursuline Sisters, and as he became Bishop of Cleveland, he wanted Catholic education to be so much a part of the new diocese. So he went and brought the Ursuline Sisters from Boulogne-sur-Mer to Cleveland to begin Catholic education. The next year, he went to a hospital. He went to a hospital in Boulogne-sur-Mer, St. Louis <coughs> Hospital where the Augustinian sisters were providing health care because the bishop wanted Catholic health care in the diocese. And that is Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine. So the Ursuline sisters, they were here only three weeks and they established Ursuline Academy. And you know the history of the Ursulines, primarily in education ministry. But they also have been in the diocesan uh, uh, mission to El Salvador, and they've been very much a witness, a witness to social justice issues. My community, 1851. We started our first hospital in 1852, St. Joseph's Hospital. But to be honest with you, it was closed in 1856. Why? Because the needs of orphans became more prevalent. Our sisters began when they came here. The bishop uh, promised a house so that we could begin our congregation. The house wasn't ready yet. So we lived in people's homes and we began providing health care in people's homes. So 1852, we founded a hospital. In those days, most people that could afford health care were cared for in their homes. So our hospital, St. Joseph Hospital, cared for many people who were in need and would not be able to get health care elsewhere. So very few antibiotics. So what happened? Many parents died and left orphan children. So our hospital became a precursor for St. Vincent's Orphanage on Monroe Street on the near west side. Again, responding to the needs of the people that we serve. And you know my, the, the uh, history of our congregation we were staffing Carmadale, which was a, not our, it was, Carmadale was never owned by the Sisters of Charity. We were in a partnership with the Catholic Diocese and Catholic Charity specifically. How about the Vincentian Sisters of Charity, who now are the Sisters of Charity of Cincinnati? The Vincentian Sisters came, again, these are following ethnic groups. 
They left Romania to assist Slovak immigrants. They came to Bedford, Ohio in 1928 to minister to a growing population of Slovak immigrants. So they ministered to the sick and the poor. These were young communities, young people coming from Europe and coming without means of having jobs available, all the things that we're so accustomed to. There was significant need that the Vincentian sisters cared for. They were primarily, we know that primarily in education, their ministry was education, but they also cared for, this, for uh, the poor and providing food for the families of the children that they were teaching. And they moved into caring for the elderly. Uh, we're very honored to be part of uh, uh, Light of Hearts Villa, which is uh, right in Bedford, Ohio. Sisters of St. Joseph of the Third Order of St. Francis, they came to really serve the Polish population in Cleveland, Ohio. They risked everything and left Germany to, found, to uh, begin their congregation in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, to respond to the needs of Polish immigrants. They were primarily educators, but they came to Ohio in 1908. Maryland Hospital is, uh, was founded by these sisters, and uh, they also, I didn't know this, but they cared for adults with special needs around St. Emmerich's School. Sisters of the Holy Spirit, founded in 1890 in Russia. Now some of these congregations, I'm telling you, they really survived a lot of, a lot of things in Europe. And it's amazing that they ever got here, number one. And number two, what they had to work with and really be able to respond to the needs of the people, incredible. So Sisters of the Holy Spirit, founded in Russia, in Cleveland, they came in 1932. Their primary ministry, caring for the elderly, and Jennings Center is uh, one of their major ministries. It is their major ministry, actually. And um, they, when they came, they came to the west side of Cleveland and started taking care of orphans and at Holy Ghost Visiting Church on the west side. So they started their new mother house in Garfield Heights uh, on farmland. Can you imagine if, if you look and see where Jennings is today? That was all farmland. <laughs> and they started their uh, beginning of their ministry to the elderly. They, in 1946, they had a fire and they lost everything. They had 13 residents die in the fire, but they rebuilt, rebuilt Jennings in 1948. Daughters of Divine Charity came in, uh, came, uh, in 1868, they were founded in Austria and they came to Cleveland to serve Croatian immigrants who work in the steel mills. They founded Leonora Hall, you know, in 1946. They serve women who are in need with, uh, might have uh, mental retardation and developmental disabilities. And then we have sisters coming from Germany, Sisters of St. Joseph of St. Mark. They started out as a cloistered community when they were founded in 1845. They had 12 sisters leave uh, Germany for Cleveland, Ohio. They uh, took charge of the diocesan seminary, uh, domestic de uh, department, and then they started in 1927, and our sisters were in the same neighborhood. They started St. Joseph's Care Center in Louisville, right near Canton, Ohio. And then 1958, Mount St. Joseph Nursing Home in Euclid, Ohio, which we're all familiar with. In, in Euclid. I keep forgetting about this. Then we have sisters who came to do a specific ministry in addition to caring for the immigrant population. The Little Sisters of the Poor were founded in 1839 in France. Their founders opened her home to a disabled elderly woman, woman and that began their work. In 1970, they came to Cleveland, established their first home, welcoming the needy elderly next to the cathedral. They had 12 women immediately fill that home because of the need was so significant. And then the immigrant population continued to increase and uh, they needed to care for the elderly among, among the immigrants. 
So they responded to the bishop's request and expanded their services and their first home, actually they quickly outgrew it. And then they purchased a larger home on East 22nd in Woodland. And then in 61, uh, the Richmond Road facility in 1961. Now the Sisters of the Incarnate Word, they were founded in France in 1625. But you know what? They were suppressed by the uh, French Revolution. Their whole community was scattered. They had to take refuge in homes, their family homes, and some were martyred. That's how bad it was for this community. And then 1807, their community was restored. Their first foundation was in Texas, in Brownsville, Texas. And then they went to Mexico. And there's a significant connection with the Sisters of the Incarnate Word in Mexico. Then they came to Cleveland in 1927. And this is a very unusual. We think of uh, the Sisters of the Incarnate Word with significant Irish uh, heritage. But they came from Mexico and they cared for the Hispanic immigrants in the Tremont area especially. In 1966, they pioneered in serving the developmentally challenged in really helping with sacramental preparation and religious uh, instructions. And then, they, in 1930, they got uh, an estate, Carl Miller Estate on Pearl Road. And uh, that was burnt down. I don't know what it is about. Probably because of the era that, we, that they were in. That whole facility was burnt down and they had to rebuild. And they opened the Incarnate Word Academy, which is a great place for uh, students and education. The Humilia Mary Sisters were founded in 1854 in France. They were founded to serve rural parishes. And in 1863, they were challenged by anti-church government in making their work and their ministry impossible. So they responded to a request to come to Ohio. And uh, the bishop gave them farm property uh, in western Pennsylvania, which we think was the property that we had owned at one point. We owned a farm in western Pennsylvania. And uh, we, we, it is the same, uh, but they have a, that's where their mother house is. Uh, and they founded an orphanage and school there. And then we know their history and teaching and their health care ministry, which has really served the diocese very well. St. East Hospital, Youngstown. But they also uh, partnered with Catholic Charities in staffing Rosemary Home. Uh, a diocesan residence for children crippled at birth. St. Joe's Hospital in Lorraine and St. Joe's Hospital in Warren, Ohio. And um, HM Life Opportunity Services, Transitional Housing Program. The Notre Dame Sisters, I better make this right, right? <laughs> they were founded by St. Julie Billiard in 1804. In 1874, the sisters left their German homeland and were welcomed into the Diocese of Cleveland. And what wonderful educators they are in this, in this diocese. They went door to door to beg for services for the orphanages, hospitals. And in 1884, they founded Mount St. Mary, an institute that really uh, was a protectorate for girls, for orphans, for families in need. We know that they are devoted to education and other ministries according to the needs of the times. Good Shepherd Sisters, remember Mary Crest, who uh, their founder in France cared for women, women that were in need, and they brought that ministry to Cleveland, Ohio with the wonderful ministry of Mary Crest for troubled women and women in need. And we know about Holy Family Cancer Home which continues the mission and ministry of the sisters, the Hawthorne Dominican Sisters, as the diocese now uh, runs Holy Family Cancer Home. So we know that women religious continue to meet needs based on the needs of the people that we serve, whether it's housing, whether it's our sister Ignatia and you know, Rosary Hall and the addiction medicine, advocating for the least among us. Uh, Dorothy Day House in Akron, in Cleveland. Uh, we have many sisters of many congregations involved in a project in Collinwood today. 
And uh, there's a project called Intergenerational Project. So we could share the stories of these women as they came and responded to the needs of this community so that others will hear the stories, hear the giftedness of the charism of each community, and be able to carry it forward, carry it forward into the future. And some people might call it succession planning, but it's really spreading the word of a call that God gave to women religious to serve people and respond to needs. That's our sister Henrietta. And I, this isn't supposed to be biased towards the Sisters of Charity, but <laughs> those were the pictures that were available. Our sister Henrietta went into the Huff neighborhood and really was about, um, uh, really one of the first in founding uh, Famicos, housing development in this community, right in the middle of a lot of the riots that happened in Huff. So we have been in partnership with Catholic Charities for a long time, women religious have been. We have formalized that in a, a project called Catholic Community Connection. Pat, are you gonna talk about that? Go ahead, yes. okay. I'm gonna mention it. <laughs> but basically, well, the, it was formed several years ago with my dear friend, Tom Mullen. We decided that we, what we really needed to do was to come together. We could serve so many more people if we collaborated and did it together. So you have Catholic Social Services and the tremendous array of service. You have women religious and others, our health system, who had a significant array of services coming together, focusing on the people that we serve. We have nursing homes. We have uh, actually um, John Carroll and Notre Dame College and uh, Ursuline College are all part of Catholic Community Connection, coming together to do what we can to continue the ministry in service to people. We staff many institutions of Catholic Charities. Um, and we now look at sustainability as the number of uh, women religious, that's Parmadale, as the number of women religious is down. And many have said, um, you know, lay people coming into leadership are coming into leadership because we don't have enough nuns. We're celebrating the gift of the laity. If you looked at Vatican II and the wonderful, wonderful learnings that came out of Vatican II about the giftedness of the laity, they are partners with us. They are our leaders. They are our future. And uh, collaborating with the laity is a tremendous gift. When I entered the convent in 1964, and I had worked at one of our hospitals before then, we had sisters as department directors in the entire hospital. <laughs> uh, I don't think we have any of our sisters as, well, Sister Miriam, uh, Vice President at St. Vincent Charity. The laity have risen to the occasion and are as dedicated and committed to the Catholic mission and identity. We have established an entity called Public Duty Person, and I'm not gonna go through that, believe me but it's an entity recognized by the church that allows us at the highest level to bring lay people with the sisters to continue the Catholic identity of our institutions and our ministries well into the future. We're all coming together, consolidating systems. We're integrating. That's what's happening in ministry today. And all of us as women religious, we have a wonderful gift in the Diocese of Cleveland, and that is that we collaborate with each other, and we share the gifts that each congregation has. And that really is what um, the Collinwood Project is about. There's, this is a, a picture of all the congregations that are part of Collinwood. And having a direct impact on the people in Collinwood, again, we're sharing resources. We're doing all that we can to be focused on serving the people of Collinwood. And that really is who we are and what we're about. So with that, I probably went way over my time. I think Father Wald is next. Sister, was, can you tell me just briefly, was, was Charity Hospital the first public? Uh, the first hospital was St. Joseph's. We came here in 1851, 1852, St. Joseph's Hospital was built. That was converted to the orphanage. Then in 1865, we, we uh, actually, we just celebrated uh, St. Vincent Charity Medical Centers. Um, celebration 
uh, just recently, 100, 150 years. How's that? Just a St. Vincent Charity was uh, founded in 1865, which was the first private hospital in the city of Cleveland. And it's still there. Amen. I'm going to go back to history for a minute. You know, I, um, when you talk about people coming from Europe, um, I've been at St. Basil's. I also used to be at St. Catherine's. We had a, one of those parish partnerships between the two parishes. And one day, St. Catherine's eventually merged with St. Henry's and St. Tim's and became Holy Spirit Parish. And they're really doing very, very well over on 131st Street. Um, I mean, actually, they're flourishing. So, and, and they did this. This wasn't with the bishop. This had nothing to do with Bishop Lennon. These three parishes got together on their own. They said, we need to do something if we're going to survive. And they did it. I mean, it was, it was long. It was not easy. But I tell you, it's been very, very a wonderful, wonderful blessing for the African-American community. But when I was at St. Catharines, and you lose, you know, just great to have a perspective of history. Um, people would come in all the time and they would say, they would look for death records because they're doing their family genealogy. So for whatever reason, I was looking for a death record for someone one day and I got to the year 1900 and St. Catharines, I think when it closed, was about 110, 115 years old. But I gotta tell you, in, in the turn of the century in 1900, nobody lived to be 65. Nobody. I could go right down the book. Nobody. And people would die at 56 of old age. Okay, of old age. And I mean, it's just, it's monumental when you think a uh, number of people that we serve in the parish now that are in their 90s, people that are 100. Nobody lived that long. And that's just, that was the folks that were being ministered to because they came here and, you know, illness and lots of other things. So, let me just say, um, and Sister could have done this as well, but. So the sisters came, all of these orphanages were established. You gotta say, how did they survive, okay? Well, the first thing that they did, they did um, orphan fairs, okay? Um, and I think that meant they sent the little orphans out to beg from people, and the orphans fair didn't work or raise enough money. And I have a number here. Um, at some point in time, the orphans fair in, in 1881 raised $8,000 to be divided between three hospitals and an infant home, okay? Almost impossible. So then, as a way to make up the deficit, they began begging tours. Who did the begging? The orphans. They sent them out, you know, probably, so the bishop, who I believe was fairly at the time, he was, found this very offensive, okay, that you're sending out the little kids to beg. So he decided something really needs to be done to end these orphan fairs and to end the begging. But the fact is, that's all they had. There was no other source of revenue at all. They were completely on their own. But the bishop found it, to quote, very distasteful. I think we all would have agreed on that. So raising funds was really just a very serious, serious problem. Um, in around 1900, a central organization, that's, that's kind of a theme that's in here. Central organization was formed, Sister talked about the, the Catholic connection, of, you know, that's another central kind of form to bring people together. And there's been, and I won't even touch on them all, but a number of these over the years that have taken place. Um, so in 1900, there was this federation created in the diocese um, to serve the needs of welfare institutions in the diocese. There, the Catholic Ladies Aid Society was formed in 1900 to help with special projects for children. They opened a home, the Catherine Horseman Home for Young Women who were unemployed in 1900, um, and they were trained then with skills so that they go out and work in the workplace. They also opened a Traveler's Aid, this is all church stuff, and you know, all these people are coming from Europe. They opened a Traveler's Aid Society to help people, to help them connect, and they did it in the Union Depot, because that's where they were all coming into town, okay? on trains, and a board of charities then was formed in, in 1910, and a priest by the name of Charles LeBlanc was appointed the first uh, 
diocesan director of, of Catholic Charities, and he was appointed by Bishop Farrelly at the time. So he then represented the diocese in the greater Cleveland area in what was known as the Cleveland Federation of Charity and Philanthropy. This was one of the precursors to what later became the United Way Services, okay? It was people coming together. So it was bigger than just Catholic folks coming together. It was the community coming together to respond to the needs of people. In the spring of 1919, Father the Blonde met with 11 prominent Catholic laymen, and he laid out the dire situation of funding for all of these institutions that were operating within the diocese. And those men, those 11, became the nucleus of what then was to become known and still is today is the Catholic Charities Corporation, which is established in April 8th of 1990, 1919. And what they started doing, so they kind of talked the pastors into supporting it. Um, the second weekend in February this year, we're going to be having the Catholic Charities Appeal. And they went out door to door, okay, in the parishes, door to door, knocking on doors. They didn't give you much chance to say no. Uh, you know, what are you gonna do if you answered the door? You're gonna give something just to get rid of them. When I went to St. Basil's in 1994, they were still knocking on doors. There was a gentleman in the parish. He'd done this his whole life. He was not gonna let go of it. I said, knock yourself out, you know? And, and he, was, he was very, very successful at this. I don't think he ever walked away from a door without a dollar or something. It just wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. It wasn't in his makeup. So that was the establishment of the fundraising organization with the Diocese of Cleveland. The first uh, drive realized $50,000 uh, $50, by 19, so that was in 19, and 22, they raised $122,000. What did they raise last year, Patrick? Um, $13 million. $13 million. So it shows how that number has grown. Um, in 1918, the first community chest appeal in the United States, first in the United States, was initiated by the Cleveland Chamber of Commerce. That's the organization that became known as the United Way Services. Is that still what it's called? Yes. United Way Services. Um, and they've always provided operational funding. Patrick would be, you know, and that's evolved over the years as well, but they've always provided operational program funding to the agencies of, of Catholic Charities. Um, I'm going to skip over a lot of this stuff. Uh, in, in about 1950, it became pretty apparent that there was a need for services beyond the greater Cleveland area, and service centers were then established by Catholic Charities in Akron, Painesville, Lorraine, Barberton, and Medina in 1947, Phil, is that when Youngstown broke off from Cleveland? Have I got that right? 43. No, that was close. Okay. 1943, Youngstown became a separate diocese, taking in Youngstown and Canton in that area. And Cleveland remained just these, the eight counties here in northeastern Ohio. So Catholic Charities just continued to grow and evolved. Um, in 1972, a uh, federation, again, another effort to bring folks together, a federation of agencies was formed for central planning, coordination, financing, funding, disseminating the, uh, allocating, if you will, the Catholic Charities Fund. That was known as the Federation of Catholic Community Services. Um, Frank Catliota, a layperson, was the first director of that. So in 1977, I returned to the diocese from Catholic University, um, having, you know, gotten that uh, master's in social work. It was it was funny when I went to Catholic U. Um, you know, when you're in the seminary, I was in the seminary from high school for nine years. I don't maybe not for everybody, but for me, you kind of figure out what you need to do to get through here, okay? And I probably wasn't the greatest student in the world, but I knew how the system worked and I knew what I needed to do. So, and I did it, you know, I was not the greatest student, but, you know, I got through there. But when I went to Catholic U, uh, it would have been totally embarrassing for me to flunk out of Catholic U. So there was no way in the world, because I didn't know, you know, this was a variable I wasn't familiar with, how this worked, okay? And most of the folks that were in the social work program with me, without exaggerating, 70% of the folks were Jewish women going back into the workforce 
after having raised their families. So, you know, that's kind of what I was up against. And, you know, I did, fortunately, I got through Catholic U and, and did very, very well. But I worked a whole lot harder there. But don't ever tell anybody this. I worked a whole lot harder there than I ever did in the seminary. Because um, you kind of figure it out, how it works, okay? Um, when I came home from school, now this is even hard for me to imagine today, um, what was going on in the diocese? A desegregation was taking place in the diocese of the public schools, and that was huge, okay? Uh, Judge Frank Batista, everywhere he went, he had two U.S. Marshals with him to protect him. I mean, it was, a, it was an interesting scene, okay? And you can go back and forth about was it successful, it don't matter. You know, it's, it's a part of history, but the diocese was heavily involved in that at that time. Um, in the late, um, the, the commissions on Catholic community action were formed in the late 60s. They were the ones uh, that established all of the community organizations and they did community organizing. Uh, using the Sololinsky model, if you will. Uh, I think a lot of their funding came from the church, from the Campaign for Human Development, but they established, and I think personally accomplished a great deal doing neighborhood organizing. Those eventually evolved into what today is known as community development corporations. They just continued to grow and evolve, and many of those continue on. Um, but, but I guess it's important to men mention that you know, when I was there, and as Patrick's there now, and Sister can tell you this too, and she mentioned the importance of the lady, these are great people that volunteered their time, their talent, their funds. I mean, there was no personal gain for them in what they were doing in serving the church in any one of these capacities, you know, with the sisters or with Catholic Charities or with the diocese. They were just, you know, these folks to me are just incredible witnesses of what it means to be a faithful, a Catholic Christian person, and they did it without just very, very selfless and self-sacrificing because they were themselves were so committed to the mission. Um, I think I'm pretty good there. I think I've covered everything. I served there from 79 then to 2000. When did I leave there? 1994 I left there and was assigned to St. Basil, and also I was at St. Catherine. So, Patrick, I'm going to turn this over to you because um, you're next, and I'm done. Thank you. Okay, sister, turn this thing off. So, make sure. You just push that middle button. It's still there. It's off. Yeah. Just touch the screen. Touch the screen. So happy when your IT guy was in there. He was great. <laughs> All right. It looks like you're going to the next slide. Oh, there you go. All right. I have to pull up my um, yep. Is there a teenager here? We're <laughs> All right. This is. I'm supposed to take this little thing. See this little thing here? Oh, let's see, I'm supposed to get the other power point this way. This, not the other one. We're in business, thanks, Doc. So when I came in here... I'm a teenager. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. came in here, I was trying to put things in place. I hadn't been in this building for a while. And the only thing I recognized was the racquetball courts. <laughs> <laughs> so Catholic Charities, it does have a wonderful history. Um, the first part of what I'm gonna do is just pretty much show you what's happened. Like, you know, sister and father had all these years to cover. I really only have 23. But I'm going to give you an update of where we are today and hopefully where we're going in the future. So from 1994 to present, the first thing significant happened, first of all, I started with St. Augustine Health Ministries that year, and uh, Tom Mullen was appointed the Director of Catholic Charities, and he had a, a wonderful reputation, uh, a very collaborative, compassionate, wonderful man, great human being, he did a great job. Um, I consider him my mentor. Um, 
He, he passed away in 2010, and then shortly after that, I was appointed to take his place, which was a tough task. So St. Augustine Health Camp, Campus, which is what I just mentioned, not very good at this. Oh, okay, push down. Tom Mullen was the first lay person to have that position after Father Walt. So St. Augusta Manor, uh, St. John's Hospital was a Sisters of Charity hospital, Sisters of Charity of St. Augusta. I was born there. It's kind of every Catholic on the West Side was born there. Um, in 1989, I believe it was, it had to close. Um, you know, the, the changes in the healthcare environment are so rapid, and the sisters found the need to close. But collaboratively with the sisters, the diocese, St. Augustine and Catholic Charities made it happen so that the original nursing home on the north side of Detroit Avenue um, was vacated and we occupied the hospital and converted it to a nursing home and a lot of other things, including a dialysis center, which was already there. Um, you know, you hear a lot about that neighborhood now. You hear about all the chefs, all the restaurants. Well, the one end of the Detroit Shoreway neighborhood has St. Augusta Manor, then we renovated St. Augustine Towers, which is now assisted living. We provided the land to La Sagrada Familia Parish next door. If you add up, the last time I added up the millions that were spent, you know, that generates jobs and, and a good standard of living for the community. And I'm very proud of that, to be a member of the, the church that I think really was a catalyst for the Detroit Shoreway neighborhood. And the sisters were a part of that too. So Sister mentioned these alliances. So we had Catholic Community Care, uh, which was Catholic hospitals and long-term care. Then we had Caritas Connection, which is the partnership between Catholic Charities, the Sisters, and their health system. 2006, you can see there's a lot of uh, crossover. We merged the two. And one of the things, Sister talked a bit about it, but one of the things I'm most proud of for years, we'd get together and we'd say, what can we do to get young people involved in Catholic ministries? Well, we're doing it now with this alliance, this Catholic, uh, care, this, uh, Catholic community connection. Um, we have service learning opportunities now for students at the three Catholic universities and others, other universities. We have internships, we have service hours where the young man who was helping set up the IT equipment uh, asked for my information because he has a group they want to do some service hours with uh, an institution. So that's just one of the things that we've, uh, that has borne fruit. Um, you know, I'm going kind of chronologically. 1996, this was short, you know, a couple years after I started with Catholic Charities, we were opening the Fatima Family Center. Sister talked about the Huff neighborhood. Um, this is a brand new family center constructed by Catholic Charities in one of the toughest neighborhoods at the time. If you go there now, they've, uh, they've totally renovated League Park, where the Indians used to play. Babe Ruth used to hit home runs. It's pretty neat. If you haven't seen it, you should go there. But you'll see, and here's another, uh, another catalyst, I think, in the community where the church stepped in and did something. I made a mistake when I first was appointed to this position of going to Fatima and, and talking about how we're meeting the needs of people. And the director got beside you and said, no, no, we're bringing people together. The community's meeting the needs of the community. And that's pretty, pretty much true. One of the best programs they have there, and, it, and it, there wasn't money for last year to run it, so I found some money for it. It's a leadership, um, I, don't, I don't know what they call it. It's a, in the summer camp, they bring the teenagers together, and they're in a separate room. They spend the whole summer going to hospitals and lawyers' firms and um, every kind of career opportunity they might be interested in. They do journals. And when I met them, it reminded me of when my kids were in the Catholic high schools. These kids have poise. They're determined these kids are going to succeed because it's all laid out there for them. Flamicos. Here's, here's the Flamicos. This, this is Catholic Charities stab at housing in the Huff neighborhood. So this is a family of townhouses that opened in 2008. Matt Talbot for Women opened in 2000. When I first came to St. Augustine, I'm like, who is this Matt Talbot? So I had to ask. Well, Matt Talbot was an alcoholic who grew up in Ireland, and that was before the 12-step program. He had to do it on his own. So he was an inspiration to a lot of people. So Matt Talbot for Women, we opened in 2000 over by the hospital. Uh, it is now on the St. Augustine campus, and I'll talk more about that 
Uh, the Mat Talbot for Men program was in the Tremont neighborhood. Now it's in Parma at the old Parmadale campus. Um, I'll mention it now. Three years ago, we were serving 40 people in residential chemical dependency programs. We're adding on right now, and when we're finished, it'll be 110. 40 to 110. The horrible crisis, the opioid crisis, you know, heroin deaths. So, but we're there to respond. And that's pretty much the story of Catholic Charities. If uh, we start out with one purpose and, and that need isn't there, Carmadale was an orphanage. When that wasn't needed anymore as an orphanage, it was converted to helping troubled youths. When that residential part of that wasn't feasible anymore, we converted the, the modern buildings to chemical dependency treatment, residential <coughs> programs. Um, back in 2004 at St. Augustine, we did a, a strategic plan and we decided to begin a hospice. And, and this, my, my challenge at St. Augustine was being in the inner city uh, where you take care of you know, people of all backgrounds, but you have a, an abundance of people who depend on the government, Medicaid, which really doesn't cover the cost of care. So the challenge was always to find new services that we could do and do well that were in keeping with our mission that would help us bring in, pay the bills of the mothership at St. Augustine. Well, um, I came back from vacation one day and Tom Mullen told me, well, guess what? The, the Sisters of Hawthorne have uh, decided to close Holy Family Home. So that fit right into our plans to begin a hospice. There is a Catholic hospice in our diocese and it's Holy Family Hospice. Um, we also serve in the community as well. That's the original building that opened in 1959. In 2007, we opened Emerald Village Retirement Community adjacent to St. Clarence Parish in North Olmsted. There's a little picture. I like pictures. I was kidding beforehand. I, I like the Turner Classic Movie Channel. And I think the interesting thing in history is the old stuff. So I appreciated that. So I was afraid, you know, like when I flip to that channel and it's in color, I turn it off because it's, it was alive at that time. I like to see the, the old stuff. But I did put pictures in there just to try to give you a visual. So in 2009, new construction at the Parmadale Institute of 100,000 square feet was completed to serve 80 children with special needs. Five years later, after that, um, just in Cuyahoga County, where they used to place 700 children, they were down to 120 or so. So you can see the needs changed. The, the, every, uh, every type of care, it's always the, the effort is to ratchet it down to um, less institutional, which is a good goal. So that's what happened with that. Um, I was appointed in 2012. Six years and, and in about a month it'll be. So we celebrated in 2012 our 100th anniversary. We had 100 days of stories on our, on our website. We had some special events throughout the year. Massive Thanksgiving. We celebrated, uh, that was by the bishop. We had a gala. And we established the Catholic Charities Hall of Hope. So you'll see some familiar, familiar faces in here. That's the Hall of Hope, and there's a history wall across from that. The honorees were uh, Most Reverend John Farley, who had the leadership and vision to create Catholic Charities. And he named Father Charles LeBlanc, who later became a bishop. And as a young priest, he became the first director, and he established the foundation for our future. So these are the first two nominees. Those are the plaques that hang on the wall. The one on the stern looking one is Bishop Farley and the one on the right is Bishop LeBlanc. Looks like he never smiled. Back then when they took pictures, they didn't smile. And here we go, the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine. The Sisters' humble, caring spirit and dedication to those in need was a driving inspiration and cornerstone of Catholic Charities. Uh, and honestly, when we did this Hall of Hope, we, we put all these inductees in at once uh, it's really only five, um, and we thought it couldn't have been done without the sisters, so we honored them. And you had, I think, almost everyone in your congregation at that day. It was fun. <coughs> Bishop Pillow, it was, it was quite moving. Here's another familiar face, Reverend Walter H. Jim. He, uh, as the Secretary of Social Concerns, Director of Catholic Charities, like I said earlier, he really brought it up to modern standards. He had his background in social work and uh, 
you know, met the standards and brought, you know, when you have a lot of loose, I don't want to say loose, but There's a, lot of loose. a lot of loose agencies that just kind of formed up with different histories. You know, they all did their own HR. They all had their own benefits. You know, it was a waste of money for one thing, but then when they got into trouble, then the church had to kind of bail them out and get them straightened up. So I think bringing them together, I, I think, has helped. Uh, Tom Mullen, my predecessor, first uh, layperson appointed to the bishop's staff, and he was a great guy, faithful to, to the ministry and a friend to the vulnerable, inspirational leader. And then Bishop Lennon decided that we would have a man of the century, so he named Bishop Hilla the man of the century. Loving compassion to those in need, commitment to the virtues of faith, hope, and love pursuit of justice, unwavering support of Catholic charities. So, in 2013, there was a, um, a not-for-profit on West 29th Street called The Covenant, and they were failing. They wanted somebody to continue their ministry. So we assumed control of the building, we hired their employees, continued their ministries, and then we moved our uh, program, so there's an old bank building at West 25th and Lorraine, so we moved those programs that has Hispanic chemical dependency, youth programs, um, mental health programs. So we're, we're over there. It's a beautiful building. And it's, uh, it was a school building. It was a historic school building. So um, we incorporated that. Now I saw it, showed you the beginning of Holy Family Home. So in 2014, we've made several renovations over there. But the building did not have a handicap accessible entrance. In order for people to come to visit, if they needed accessibility, they had to go to the back uh, by the morgue. There's a little morgue, which it wasn't dignified. Is that what the bishops said back in the, the morgue? Yeah, it was not good. So we ended up, you can see on the right, there's a covered walkway. So the first stab at this, and they were almost ready to start, and I went to a meeting, and there was freezing rain at Holy Family. And somebody was dropping uh, his wife off, and she had to get out in the freezing rain and, and come up the stairs. And I said, look at this. Now, your plan calls for the handicap ramp to be not under the covered part, but off to the side. The reason you have it is so people don't have to walk in the freezing rain. So what we did, and this, this is one, it costs some money, but we raised the road <laughs> so that, the, so that the, there'd be, the slope wouldn't be so steep that people would have to walk this meandering path outside of the, uh, you know, so you walk right in under the, the overhang and you get into the building. So it's beautiful. Camp Christopher, you know, you're going to learn through these pictures a little bit about what we have at Catholic Charities. Camp Christopher in Bath, Ohio, it's a beautiful property, wonderful property. And it remains a camp. It's used year round. In the uh, 1950s, the Knights of Columbus built all the cabins. They did a great job, except they used cinder blocks to prop them up. Well, now the cinder blocks are shifting, and the cabins are starting to fall down. So this was the first one that we built new. And you'd think, you know, just building a cabin in the woods isn't expensive. Well, when the building department comes in, and you know, it, it's amazing. This was. Um, I think it's about $160,000 just to build a cabin. So we need about 15 or 16 more. We'll, we'll do them gradually. <laughs> so I talked to you about changing needs and adjusting to the needs. Rosemary Home opened 95 years ago, Rosemary Center, and they serve children with physical disabilities, okay? So over time, um, things changed, polio, I mean, there wasn't such a need for them to go to an institutional setting, so they shifted to serving children with developmental disabilities. So for many, many years now, that, that was in the institutional setting, uh, there were additions to the building in, 19, in the 1980s, but basically, um, kids don't belong growing up in an institution. And we, two years ago, made a commitment to move the last 40 children out of the institution and into community homes. So this is one on Ridgewood in Parma Heights. Most of the others are on the east side. Um, each of these homes is designed for six children. They have their own room. They have a backyard if they're hungry. They have a refrigerator they can go into. It's how children can, should grow up, not in the institution. If you get a chance to see our annual appeal video, this is featured in it, and it shows 
video of the old home, the old institution, compared to this. So this is one little girl's bedroom, and they, they personalized it. Um, they have places to store their things. It's just what kids should have. Uh, here's the common area for the six children where they, where they have their meals. So the Matt Talbot programs. I mentioned this already, so I'll skip this, but from 2014 to 2070, we've grown from 40 to 110. Sad, sad fact. This is the one in Lakewood. Uh, it was just, uh, let's see. I get my time and dates. The older I get, it's harder. I think it was just a year ago that we moved into this uh, convent that the Sisters of Notre Dame, is it? I'll tell you what, that building was beautiful. We have to move one of the men's programs, and we found a convent at St. Boniface, and all I can say is it's not like the Notre Dame's left the one at Transfiguration. And it's funny, you get, uh, when, we, when we move people with addictions to Parmadale, I was getting calls from the council people, getting calls from the neighbor. Now that is so isolated, you don't, you don't even see what's going on there. But I had to tell people, if you drew a one mile circle around where you are today, you would have 15 times as many addicts in that circle not seeking treatment as opposed to how many are in this building committed to recovery. So you get a little pushback with neighbors, but we try to inform them and set the record straight. So in, um, let's see, there's a, there's a church in Lorraine, and it's St. Joseph's, and about 20 years ago, they began to serve the homeless in the church. There was a, there was a uh, classroom, that, so they put men up, and they grew to 50 beds. The church closed in 2010, and then all of a sudden, the city swooped down on and Catholic Charities, because the church closed, and Catholic Charities took over operation of the homeless shelter. Well, the building department kind of came crashing down on us and told us we needed sprinklers, we needed wider doors, we needed zoning, we needed all this stuff. So for five years, we've been struggling to um, meet their expectations. We've been getting temporary occupancy permits. And it's near the business di district, or what's left of it in Lorraine. So, you know Lorraine. <laughs> um, but we also have what we call uh, the, the Lorraine Family Center, not too far from there, where we have a drop-in program. We provide meals, breakfast, and lunch, uh, social services. So. With the city's cooperation and blessing, we found a third location. It's an old social hall. It's a Polish hall. It's at 28th and Carolyn, if you know Lorraine. So just this month, we started construction on, we're calling it the St. Elizabeth Center, and it's going to house both of those programs. Uh, some of the men have to sleep in a basement. You know, and they do have windows high up, but it's not, again, dignified. So this new place will be dignified. We'll be proud to, to have it there. Um, it's the St. Elizabeth Center because our patroness saint is St. Elizabeth of Hungary. And this is just for sister. This is the St. Vincent Charity Hospital with all the days, right? I think that's it. Phil said it was. Center building just went down. Yeah. 1917. So I wanted to show you, you know, the annual appeal campaign is just, I just, I remember growing up just energizes everybody. So these are some old posters that were in Phil's archives. Next one's my favorite. Nope, well that's one of my favorites. The next one I think is funny. All Catholics should give, exclamation mark. If this was a text, it would be in all caps. It is in all caps. I mean, that's the first text with a lot of emphasis, I think. Okay, so today, we serve at Catholic Charities almost 400,000 people a year. That's phenomenal. The, uh, when the story of Catholic Charities is told to the faithful, they respond. So we, we make a lot of effort now with videos, and, and I encourage you to go on our website and look at the video. And not because it encourages you to give, but it gives you more information about what we do at Catholic Charities. It's uh, so diverse, the services that we provide. And if you, I hope you picked up your one-page, two-sided, handout back there that just tries to summarize what we do at Catholic Charities. So we're in all eight counties of the diocese. But you know, you know from sister and father why we do what we do. Pope, Pope Benedict really expressed 
the ministries of charities in his first encyclical very well. He said that there are three main functions of the Catholic Church. Proclaim the word of God, celebrate the sacraments, and exercise the ministries of charity. And he called those equal, and one without the other, two isn't a complete church. So if you look at it this way, at, on every level, your personal level, you, you attend to ministries of charity on your own level. At your parish or your congregation, you do the same thing. Well, for Catholic charities, we're the institutional level. So the, the St. Augustine Manor or a Cosgrove Center uh, downtown, a parish couldn't do that. So we're one of those three key functions at that level. We're in all eight counties. So we're broken down by different categories, family and community services. We have three family centers on the east side in some of the poorest neighborhoods. They, they have a senior program in each one, they have children programs, mentoring, help me grow programs, a lot of comprehensive things for families. Head Start falls under that too. Persons with disabilities, Rosemary Center. Disability services, we have a summer program called Camp Happiness for Disabled Kids. <coughs> Emergency services, we serve hundreds and thousands of, of meals and uh, take care of the homeless. Elderly, chronically ill, we have St. Augustine Health Ministries, Holy Family Hospice, the Hispanic Senior Center, Treatment Prevention and Recovery, that's the Matt Talbot programs, the Hispanic Youth programs, Parish Outreach, the Office of Human Life, Marriage and Family, Youth and Young Adult Ministry. Some of these things are usually done in a diocese rather than Catholic charities, but we're happy to do it. Social Action Office, that's also part of Catholic charity. So I like to say uh, we take care of people from even prenatal through death and everything in between. Always in a dignified way, recognizing the dignity and worth of every individual, uh, using our Bible, our, our gospel message as our inspiration and the foundation for everything that we do. So, I, you know, uh, we, we're supposed to talk a little bit about the future. So last year we raised about 12 million 12 million in our annual appeal. It's a very generous diocese. We're one of the biggest Catholic charities in the United States. We're one of the few that has an annual appeal dedicated just to Catholic charities. We've been blessed. Um, we really are in partnership with the parishes. Father Walt has to get up and convince people to fill out the pledge cards and ask them to give. And as long as they understand the depth and breadth of what we do at Catholic Charities, they respond generously. So what's, what does the future hold with mass attendance declining? And it's, the millennials are hard to capture. Uh, people are, you know, I, I think it's less than 25% of people who are Catholic actually go to mass. So what's happening for us right now, if I look at what we raised in 2009, we had 61,700 donors, and the average gift was $168. So that came up to almost $10 million, 9.99. So in 2016, instead of 61,700, we had 52,300. So that's a pretty, a pretty significant erosion in donors. The average gift, however, was $249. So we raised 13 million. So we're very fortunate that uh, but, but the ones that we're missing are the $50, the ones that are the younger people. So how do we, what's going to happen in the future? We don't know. But we do know that we have to find a different way of reaching people. Um, social media comes to mind. We, we try to do a lot of that, e-newsletters. Um, if you've seen Northeast Ohio Catholic Magazine, there are three, three stories about Catholic charities in it. The good thing about that, as long as somebody's registered in a parish, uh, how many of the registered in your parish come to Mass regularly? About 30%. 30%. So we're getting the other 70% through the magazine, because, and that's a really a brilliant uh, development, because the Universe Bulletin didn't really reach that many people. So we are continuing with planning and searching for innovative ways to, uh, you know, these the, the $13 million, our budget's about $98 million. So it's a, it's again, it's like a catalyst. Uh, if you, St. Augustine Manor would not be there without the allocation from our annual appeal. It could not possibly survive as a nursing home in the inner city taking care of a lot of people on Medicaid. 
uh, the Cosgrove Center wouldn't be there. This, this shelter I'm talking about in the rain would not be there. Uh, so it, it does kind of uh, leverage us to get you know, government money for, for various things and grant money. But without that annual appeal, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. So I think we're going to have a period of question and answer. And I thank you for being here tonight. I hope you learned something. And I hope you uh, enjoy history, too. Medicaid in Ohio impact Catholic charities? You know, one, probably could hear me, can't you? You know, one area that's always kind of like the, I don't know, the redheaded stepchild of healthcare is mental health. So you have people who, before Medicaid expansion, made too much to get Medicaid. So it made a lot more people, and, and we would see them anyway. And it was a sliding scale. It means you come for mental health services and your bill is $10 doesn't really pay for it. Uh, and we were the one, we, as Catholic Charities, we were getting most of those. And by the way, Sisters Hospital is the mental health hospital in Cleveland. That's where everybody goes for emergencies. So it helped tremendously get people qualified who were in that gap, out of the work before, without insurance. <coughs> Any other questions? The Catholic Charities appeal, does it ever go outside of the Catholic community? I, I'm laughing because we had a board meeting last night, and there's a doctor named Dr. Uh, Freddy I. He, he, he was a burn specialist at Metro Health, and that's what he asked. Um, we have tried, but it doesn't get a whole lot of traction. But we, again, we have to keep trying different ways. But he wanted. I, he said, "Well, you should go into Protestant churches." I don't think they'd let us in because they want to collect the money too for for their interests, but. Um, you know, we employ mostly, you get more people who are not Catholic than are. We serve, especially in some of these mission ministries, people who are not Catholic, more than we do Catholic by a long shot. Um, so, I mean, it should appeal to people of all faiths because we're, we really do. Good, good question. Uh, how is the uh, House Catholic Charities or the, the diocese responding to issues of uh, immigration or refugees these days? I meant, I meant to mention that. I'm glad you brought that up. Because we found out about the executive order yesterday, right before we were going to this board meeting. Well, we resettle, we're the largest resettlement agency in the Cleveland area. We're one of three. And how we're responding, we're, we're talking to the media a little bit. I don't, did the official executive order get signed yet? I, I don't know. It. Initially, it was something that kind of leaked out. So I talked with the director of Migration and Refugee Services, and we decided, well, we're not going to say much until we see what's really in it. But if it does happen, I mean, it's 120 days. Um, the fact of the matter is, I believe the vetting is very good. So I don't have any reason for concern about the vetting of refugees. And a refugee, people get mixed up. They think of a refugee and a migrant and a Asylum seeker are all the same. A refugee is forced out of their own country because of persecution or you know, religious intolerance or something like that, political. They have to reside in another country. They have to go to, for our program in the United States, they have to go live in a UN resettlement camp. Now, before they started accelerating the time period, we met people that were there for 20 years. So even if it's only 18 months, at the end of your stay in that refugee camp, then you find out which of the 28 countries you're going to. So if your thought was to come and do harm in the United States, would you choose to do it that way? <laughs> and the betting, who, who could be against thorough betting? But even, I don't think we need 120 days to do that. But we've been expanding, that's another area, we've expanded every year. When I started, it was about 300. Now it's about 450 a year. And it's wonderful. If you ever want to see something just totally heartwarming, you go in the morning at, at our uh, Migration and Refugee Services, and you see all the different classrooms learning English. And a study was done about four years ago measuring the economic impact of those refugees. Most of them get jobs. Six months to a year, they get a job. They're buying houses. They're, uh, they're hard workers. They really are happy to be here. They appreciate what they have when they find a home here. Any others? Um, 
Does Catholic Charities have any volunteer opportunities? I do ask that. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> we actually have a, a volunteer coordinator on our website. Absolutely. We, we have thousands of volunteers because we're in the eight counties. So, yeah, definitely. Individuals, groups. Yeah. What kind of work do the volunteers do? Well, just about anything under the sun. What, what would you be interested in? Or the, um, sickly or disabled. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the cafeteria at St. Augustine, there was a volunteer helping serve meals. Sometimes they have to clean tables. Sometimes they transport residents there. They bring the women to the beauty shop to get their hair done. It's, it's nice. And we have you know, assisted living, too. Yeah. What other initiatives are you um, trying to, to implement? to bring in, again, because you have a declining population of the Catholic Church, you have a you know, declining population of people who have children, you have you know, people not being active in the, the Catholic Church. So what are some of the forward-thinking initiatives you're looking to do as the population ages that are your supporters to but engage them? I think what happened in the meantime, well, first of all, there's a, a new evangelization, the, the evangelization initiative in the diocese to try to, you know, the, the, the night of, uh, Confessions, other efforts to try to bring the youth back, uh, making the catechism more traditional than it was. But what we've done that's been successful is we have these relationship managers that really reach out to people. And it started with the Rooted in Faith campaign um, to get people to ask them to donate. And people called Bishop Lennon crazy because he said he was going to raise 125 million. I was raised 170. <laughs> so we learned a lot, and I think the priests learned a lot about asking for money because if if they made their goal, every dollar over the goal went to the parish for projects, and all these priests had projects that they had that they were just waiting to figure out how to uh, make them happen and made them happen. But long term, we're going to have to get creative. Well, I was I was a finance counsel in my own parish oh. for that, and I said, you know, why don't we do a breakdown to look where the dollars are coming from because. You know, we know it's coming from the older donors, basically we're not engaging, and if they can't give the dollars because they have children and tuition and so forth, they said, how can you engage them in another way to, to bring them into the pipeline? You know what helped was, and these are people on the pews though, as much as it irritates the pastors filling out the cards all together <laughs> as a community, it helps. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it causes whether they get $5, you get their name and they, they get a, a letter. Right. Uh, it's a challenge because the $50 donations are the, that's the category that's eroding. Sure. So that tells you those people are going to move up. And hopefully they come back to the church. If they don't, you know, like I said, that the, uh, we can try to reach them with the magazine. If they read it, they get it. It's really interesting. Um, and I just think the keeping up with the electronic media and, and trying to reach people that way. I just looked through my Twitter. I saw you on Facebook. Or on Twitter, I couldn't tell you how to get it. <laughs> but, uh, my uh, marketing director is on maternity leave. It's quite a challenge putting this thing together. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I have a question about uh, with the client resources, maybe getting the different parishes to maybe the Gothic Catholic Agency working together, maybe like putting out the opiate addiction, doing uh, people from the agency coming to different parishes throughout the, the whole diocese and every doing a, a program, let's say, and getting people, uh, I mean, with, with the amount that's going on now, everybody's heard about it, might know somebody, or know somebody that knows somebody. Sure. Uh, you know, some of the best examples of partnerships, I think, in the Lorraine, or the, uh, the, the homeless shelter, mm -hmm. the parishes in the whole neighborhood, they provide all the needs. Mm -hmm. They come and cook them, they cook them and bring them in, and we have Protestant uh, denominations as well. I think in Akron is a good example. We're working with the parish of Blessed Trinity. We moved our, our food pantry and emergency assistance into the uh, into the parish. Um, you have to be careful with chemical dependency because it's anonymous too. So you know, if you wanted to see something out of Matt Talbot when they're in the group, I really couldn't bring you through. Um, but there are you know Bible study and things like that 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 can be done in the evenings. There are things that can be. There are lots of opportunities to work with uh, Catholic Charities agencies and like community with this group of volunteers, or, uh, mentoring youth, anything like that. I think that intergenerational is one of the best ways to bring millennials in. I think 
I don't know a lot about it now, but through service, working alongside people in the agencies, and then I think they get kids get hooked by that personal interaction, and that I think has the potential. That's why I was so excited about Catholic community care, because these kids are going to come in and we're going to talk to them about working in the ministry of the church, and a group of Ursula freshmen will be coming in, I think, maybe next Friday, just to get a like an orientation, a part of what we're going to talk to them about what it's like to work. And there's some gathering on March 12th at Richfield. That's uh, yeah, which is a kind of part of that generation. Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Any others? Any others? Any questions for father or sister? We're doing fine, yeah. yeah. I've got one more. It's historical. When the decision was made in the early part of the 20th century to become part of the community chest in what was a reasonably Protestant-dominated Cleveland, that must have been gut-wrenching. And how did that work? Why did they do it? And how did they manage that? You know, I don't, I, I don't think I know the answer to that. It came, as I said, out of the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, and basically there was kind of an equal proportion between Catholic Charities and the Jewish Federation. We're really original partners in the whole thing, and it's just always been recognized that way. But there was, it, it had to, that had to be a hard sell for Catholics and Jews to be able to pull this off because you know, they weren't really readily accepted um, by, the, you know, by the Protestant community. So, I don't know, maybe the hearts of people is what turned it. That's all about all it could be. I read uh, when, you know, just a, a year after I was appointed, I had to plan all this stuff for the 100th anniversary. And one thing I read was the meeting they had to, you know, decide how to organize Catholic Charities was at the Union Club. And the comment was a couple of years earlier that they wouldn't have been able to be admitted in, into even as guests. It was different back then. And, you know, and, and for years, uh, Sam Miller's been an incredible voice. You know, not only for the Jewish community, but for the Catholic community. I mean, he's just been, uh, you know, he beat me up a couple of times. He was <laughs> having some interesting conversations with, with Sam, but he's a remarkable man, you know, and he's still going. I mean, he's still doing good things, even though he's got to be well in his 90s now. But he was instrumental in even with the Catholic Church. He's very close to Bishop Hill, of course. Very good friends. He told Bishop Hill you have to raise money the Jewish one. <laughs> Whatever that is, I don't know. I know what it is. <laughs> so he, um, I probably shouldn't even say this, but it was interesting. He took me to, uh, he said to me one day, I'm going to show you how to raise money. Because I don't even know what you're doing. So I said, okay. So we went to this, um, and you're probably familiar with this. He, it was a um, fundraiser for, um, I don't know what to be called, but it was Bonds for Israel. Okay. So, um, and I had never been in this environment. So it was a nice dinner. And somebody got up, said, um, you know, I'm chairing this, and uh, I'm going to pledge $25,000 to Bonds for Israel. He said, now let's go around the room. And he just started pointing at people. He said, okay, Fred, what are you going to give? Fred got up. This really happened. Fred said, well, I'm going to give $10,000 to Bonds for Israel. The person that was chairing the meeting said, you know what? You know, and I know, you can do better than that. <laughs> And I could just see me at St. Basil the Great saying, you know, and I know, and the guy did do better. And you know, I, I kind of learned there, it was just the way it is, you know, not so bad. I mean, um, but you know, when I give my 20000 to Bonds for Israel, next time around, you're going to give 20000 to whatever my cause is. You know, I mean, it's, there's a lot of chits that are exchanged here. I figure this is all done somehow on chits, but I... It was a great learning lesson, but I, I couldn't apply it. It just wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I'd have been run out of town. <laughs> you know, and I know, you can do better than that. That's enough for that. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. Yeah.